for chapel. Will you stand with me, please? Father God, we're so thankful for who you are, what you've done, sending your only begotten Son. And Father, we're thankful for those that are listening tonight, those that will listen. Lord, we pray for those in Pakistan and in Africa and all the different places where they listen, Lord. And we ask that you would just strengthen them and cause them to grow in faith and protect them from the the enemy, Lord. May they just be a a brilliant light in the, the dark areas where they're at. So, Father, as we turn to you and we worship you, we We want to worship you in spirit and truth, and we want to hear you speak through your word tonight. So again, Lord, just reveal yourself in a very special way to each and every one of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen, amen. And thank you, Lord. We rise as we wait upon the Lord. We wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon our God. You reign forever. Our hope, our strong As I come into your presence, past the gates of praise, into your sanctuary, till we're standing face to face. I look upon your countenance, I see the fullness of your grace. 
And I can only bow down and say You are awesome in this place Mighty God You are awesome in this place Of a Father You are worthy of all praise To you our lives we raise You are awesome in this place Mighty God Oh, you are awesome in this place, mighty God. You are awesome in this place, of a Father. Oh, you are worthy of all praise. To you our lives be. You are awesome in this place, mighty God. You are awesome, Lord. As I come into your presence, past the gates of praise, to your sanctuary Till we're standing face to face I look upon your countenance I see the fullness of your grace And I can only bow down And say, oh You are awesome in this place You are awesome in this place, Abba Father, oh, you are worthy of all praise, to you our lives we raise, you are awesome in this place, mighty God. You are awesome in this place, mighty God. Mighty God. Hallelujah. Mighty God, you are great, Lord. You are awesome. When I fear my faith will fail Christ will hold me fast when the tempter would prevail, he will hold me fast. I could never keep my hold through life's fearful path. For my life is often cold, he will hold me fast. Fresh 
sits in his holy sight He will hold me fast He'll not let my soul be lost His promises shall last But by him at such a cost He will Princes and paupers, sons and daughters, kneel at the throne of grace. Losers and winners, saints and sinners, one day we'll see his face. And we all will surrender their crowns and worship Jesus for he is the love unfailing love he is the love of God Summers and winters, mountains and rivers, whisper the Savior's name. Awesome and holy, he's a friend to the lonely, forever his love will reign. And we'll all bow. will surrender their crowns and worship Jesus, for he is the love, unfailing love, he is the love of God, he's the light of the world, the Lord of 
the cross and we'll all bow down kings will surrender their crowns and worship Jesus and worship Jesus and worship Jesus for he is the love unfailing love he is the love of God Yes, we're here to praise you, Lord. We love you. How good and pleasant it is to dwell together in unity. And praise the Lord, and praise the Lord. How good and pleasant it is when come together in unity. And praise the Lord, and praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. How good and pleasant. How good and pleasant it is when we come together in unity. And praise the Lord. And praise the Lord. How good and pleasant it is when we come together in unity. And praise the Lord. And praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, showers of blessings, showers they fall, when we love and live in unity. And we lift one voice loud and strong. As far as the east is from the west, the north is to the south. What we're gonna do? Praise the Lord, yes. Praise the Lord. From the rising of the sun, to the going down of the same, we going to praise the Lord, praise the Lord. No matter what comes against us, no matter what the world says, we're going to praise the Lord, praise the Lord. We know it won't be long, we'll see our Savior coming in those clouds, we're going to praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, hallelujah, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise you Lord. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You are our God. 
We love you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. wait on you, Lord. We thank you and honor you and praise you, Lord. We want to hear your word, Lord, and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. If you have your Bibles, please open with me to the book of Micah. We're going to be looking at Micah chapter 7. We're going to finish the book tonight in chapter 7, and then next week we will do a a survey where we'll tie all seven chapters together. Well, let's open in prayer. Father, again, we thank you that you are here in your Holy Spirit moving among us. Father, we pray for your will to be in our hearts. We pray for your church that would have a boldness to be the light, the witness in these last days. As it becomes darker and darker morally, Lord, that our lives would shine brighter and brighter, no matter where we're at in the world. Knowing that you're the one that will sustain us, you're the one that will empower us and keep us until that day. We ask, Lord, that you will snatch those that are in the fire out, bring them to yourself before that final judgment comes. In Jesus' name, amen. Tonight I've titled the message, Light at the End of the Tunnel. You ever been in that place where things are just so dark? It, it almost seems impossible. There, where else can you turn? But when you look to the Lord, when you know the Lord, you know there's light at the end of that tunnel. 
years ago, my, my son was uh, moving in a little different direction, and God kind of gave me a picture of this pipe, and if I would hold a pipe up, I could see you, and you could see me through that pipe, but, but it's as if the pipe had got moved, and there was light on one end and light on the other end. And God gave me perfect peace and assurance that he came in the light and he will come out in the light. See, every true believer is kept by the power of God that, until that day. But not everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Oh, I know that's what the scripture says, but, but when you read in totality, not everyone who calls himself a Christian is a Christian. We're going to see tonight, not every Jewish person is a, is a Jew, a, a believer in the Lord. And we'll see that tonight, especially, and that applies to us as well. Well, Micah, the prophet, Micah is the, the one that's writing this book, led by the Holy Spirit, is lamenting over the moral bankruptcy of the society and the, the lack of moral responsibility. Does that sound familiar even in our own culture? You've seen it in Roman culture. You've seen it in many cultures. And it's like we learn nothing from history, do we? And yet God's word is very clear. But what is it he sees? He sees treachery, violence, bloodthirstness, along with a, a corrupt political and judicial decision makers. That's the, 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 the political leaders. And you see that in countries around the world. It's power. But he promises, that is Micah, punishment, judgment for these. He knows that vengeance is, is the Lord's. And while he knows there's this promise of punishment, he also knows there's light at the end of the tunnel. He also knows that this light is, is really the, the promises that were given to Abraham will finally come to a point where they're all fulfilled. Where every parcel of land that God had promised will be given to them. This will be during the millennial kingdom. See, all these things are leading up and pointing. They have, they have a, 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 again, a meaning for that period of time, but also it's prophetic. Well, again, no matter how dark it is, Gets Micah never loses hope. What encouragement. When, when you're reading this book, he, he, he sees the darkness, the moral depravity. What's that hope? He knows. He knows the best is yet to come. He knows that God will keep his promise. He knows that God is faithful to his very word. And that's what sustains you and sustains me when things are just, it, it just seems like they're closing in. Again, he recognizes the justice of God is present. Then it appears as you look around that God's hand is beginning to move players. Judgment is coming. You see it too even in our culture. What many have sown, they're now beginning to reap around the world. Even in the church, it seems as if God is moving in the church and purging the church of True believers and unbelievers. And the false teachers we've been talking about and false prophets on Sunday morning and God's dealing with them. People are beginning to wake up. That is the, the true church. But the thing I like is Micah never loses sight of the hope. And for you and me, it's the same. We, we should never lose sight of the hope that Jesus could come even tonight, that we're looking in that anticipation, looking in that expectation, and, and that's what helps us move from day to day. We know it's only a matter of time. God's timing is different than ours. We have that assurance. Again, God's promises were given to the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and and. And they rested in their faith upon what God has said, that God is a faithful God, and also that he has a forgiving nature, we're going to see. Unswerving loyalty to those who call upon his name that are sincere in their heart. 
Well, look with me. We'll begin in verse 1 of our text tonight, chapter 7. Verses 1 to 6 kind of are pulled together, and it gives us really Israel's sorrows. It begins this way, Woe is me, for I am like a fruit picker, like a grape gathers. There's not a cluster of grapes to eat, or a first ripe fig which I crave. The godly person has perished from the land, and there is no upright person among them, and all of them lie in wait for bloodshed. Each of them hunts the other with a net. And the prophets, uh, the prophets not only declared God's message with their lips, but they felt the pain. They felt the sorrow. They turned around. They saw the grief. And I think that should be true of us, too. Instead of judging those around us, they're already under condemnation. Shouldn't we weep over the lost? Certainly we do if it's our family, someone close to us, but, but all of those that are blinded by the God of this world, sincere but sincerely wrong. The prophets grieved. They wept. They felt the burden of the people in their hearts. And like it continued, as you noticed in the text, to, Again, the lament, the lament, the, the coming judgment. He knew it was going to get worse, even more difficult. And he said that his, his heart felt empty like the fields of a harvest. And he gives us this picture, an allegory we're going to see and look at it. And that's how the prophets and the Middle Eastern minds speak, relating to, to God coming to the harvest. And he's coming to the harvest. He's is, is likening himself to God, but not really God, but how God must come to the harvest and how he grieves. Again, in Jeremiah 9, 1, it says, Oh, that my head were waters and my eyes fountains of tears and that I might weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. And then there was Paul who was willing to give up his own salvation if it were possible for his brethren to be saved. See, this is the heart that God wants for you and me. When he, he pours his love into our, our hearts, Little by little, he's chipping the hardness away, the, the unforgiveness and the bitterness. He's dealing with this, that we will have a, a heart like, again, the Savior. One reason Micah lamented was that the, there were no godly people left. Do you ever feel that way, that, you know, like you're the only Christian? People don't think the same. Sometimes even in churches, I've heard people say, I, you know, they come, but... They don't act like Christians. What is a Christian? A Christian is one who is like Christ. Unless you look at Christ, you'll never know what a Christian is. Speaking for God, Mike is just where we're seeing that he's keenly disappointed. The Lord's coming looking for the fruit of righteousness. What would he find if he came today in your life? Would there be fruit, sweet? The love that reaches out, encourages, builds up instead of tears down. Micah's using this allegory again to explain really that he's representing God. This is how God looks at the harvest. He likens again this, this again, the, the vineyard, as Isaiah 5 would talk about it. And that's the Lord's vineyard, and the Lord's coming. And the fruit is rotten, emotionally disappointed, because he couldn't satisfy the craving. The Lord is longing for righteousness in your life and my life. Right thinking, kindness and mercy and love. And he's looking for these cluster of grapes and early figs, and, and, and it's just a picture of, of, again, the fruit of righteousness that he desires. Micah is simply lamenting over society's degenerated. Have you noticed that in our own culture? The old-fashioned values of honesty and integrity, they disappeared. People laugh, that's old school. There's no values the same. The fruit which represents godly, upright persons, they're no longer found. 
We look around today, and, and, and the Lord has already told us that in the end times, he'll send a famine of hearing. Not food, hearing. Because people don't want to hear the truth, the truth will set them free because they have itching ears. They want the people to tell them what they want to hear. Again, in verse 2, the godly person has perished from the land, and there's no upright person among them. Let me read from Psalm 14, verse 1 through 3. A fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They've committed abominable deeds. There's no one who does good. The Lord has looked down from the heaven upon the sons of men to see if there's any who understand, who seek after God. They have all turned aside together. They have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. See, what he's describing, the fool, fool says there's no God, but, but there are people that come to church, people that re- say they read the Bible, and they say there's a God, but they don't live as if they're a God. They're hypocrites. And those hard words, they make people uncomfortable. But that's why the Scripture says we're to examine ourselves and see if we're of the faith. Micah is describing a generation that was much like what was before the flood. It's like our generation is moving in that same pattern before the tribulation comes. In Genesis 6, 5, it says, Then the Lord saw the wickedness of men was great upon the earth, and that every intent of their thoughts, of their heart, was only on evil continually. You're going to see that as we go through the scripture tonight. This, it was like they were turned over to a reprobate mind, the worst thing that could ever happen to you and me. Look with me in verse 3. It says, concerning evil, both hands do well. The prince asks, also the judge, the bribe, the great man speaks of desire of his soul, so they weave it together. See, the people continually did evil. It, it, it's noting especially the, the leaders, political leaders and religious leaders as well. And that idea that it, concerning evil, that both hands do well, it, it means they're skilled in doing evil. It comes natural. They work at it to perfect it to the highest form of evil. The rulers demanded payoffs. The judges accepted bribes. The rich and influential conspired to get what they wanted. They used their money to manipulate. Now, Micah's uh, illusions are alive. They're, They're with sights and sounds of nature. and It's agrarian agricultural scene. And this is why he speaks in this, again, in this, this way, the Middle Eastern mind thought that way. Again, in verse 4, it says that the best of them is like a briar, most upright like a, a thorn hedge. Many consider a briar to be a, a prickety boxwood, tiny little leaves, no shade underneath it. In some cases, some have described it as just a long vine that comes out like a, a berry vine, but long thorns. The last time I was in Israel, I was going through bushes that were getting higher and higher as I was going, and I was going to where the witch of Endor would have been. And all of a sudden, I fell in a hole, and when I fell in the hole, I fell in among these briars. And let me tell you, they poke you, they scratch you, they cut you, they tear the flesh in in some cases. So he uses this idea of this briar Instead of helping people, they're like briar. They're thorny. They're barriers to justice. Instead of bringing, being God's instruments to, to bring reconciliation be, between people, they were dividing. The language, it's strong. It's negative and characterization of the people. And they were just hard to get along with. You ever know anybody that's just hard to get along with? No matter how hard you try, they just they want to fight against you. And this is the kind of person he's talking about. I like what Luke 6.44 says, For each tree is known by its fruit. For men do not gather figs from thorns, nor do they pick grapes from a, a briar bush. You'll know them by their fruit. You'll know them by their actions. Oh, they can say whatever they want, call themselves whatever they want, but, man, the proof is in the pudding. 
Their life repels people. Again, in verse 4, it says, In the day when you post your watchmen, your punishment will come, and then the confusion will occur. The prophets were likened again to watchmen. They were assigned, in this sense, to warn the approaching danger. In this case, it was the pending judgment that was going to come upon the enemy as well as Israel in some cases. A watchman. Some people like to take that title that they're a watchman at the gate, and certainly they had watchmen at the gate, but you too are a watchman. You know the impending danger. You know the judgment is about to fall, and you have been given words of life, words of hope. And you need to share those words or the blood will be on your hands. Ezekiel talks about that. Ezekiel 3, 17 says, Son of man, I have appointed you a watchman to the house of Israel. And whenever you hear the word from my mouth, warn them from me. And likewise, you may not be a prophet. I'm not a prophet. But, but we know that God has spoken, spoken through his word. And when we see someone is headed down that wrong course. As if somebody were driving up the Hamakua coast and they were driving very fast. And you'd warn them, there's a curve up. You've got to slow down, there's a curve. But if they pay no attention off, they go that curve down the embankment several hundreds of feet. We have a responsibility as believers to tell others about what is coming same time, Micah, the watchman, he's looking intently. He's looking for the evidence of, of God's hand, God's moving. What is God's next thing that he's going to do? And he wants to be in that straight and narrow path. It's in verse 5. Notice what it says. Do not trust in a neighbor. Do, do not have confidence in a friend from her who lies in your bosom. Guard your lips, for your son treats fathers contemptuously, and a daughter rises up against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies are the men of his own household. It sounds much like the tribulation in many ways, doesn't it? And yet we see that in some cultures, some families. The hatred, disrespect for one another. The culture that's always exalting themselves and doing that, they put everyone down. What we see is the rise of rebellion here, a spirit of rebellion, be defined really by both the nations. The prophet expands on the theme, the breakdown of these. This family relationships is what he's talking in this text, and he gives us three, three examples. People deserve the day of judgment. There's not a question in and punishment that is coming. I like what, again, the TEV, the Good News Translation says, sons treat like fools, or they treat their fathers like fools. We see that disrespect today. Fathers, mothers, laughing, mocking, having no regard for them at all. Exodus 20, 12 reminds us what God said again to the children of Israel. Honor your father, your mother, that your days may be prolonged in the land in which the Lord your God gives you. This is not new news. This is something old. In fact, when, when a child desires to honor his father and mother, his, his days will be extended. He will be blessed beyond anything he can imagine. But the people here, they're untrustworthy. Not a friend, even a spouse could be trusted. Could you imagine your own wife, you can't trust her? Your best friends turned against you? Again, the people were guilty of treachery, dishonoring, betraying one another, even their own family. It used to be the family, blood was thicker than you know, wine, they would say. Families are being ripped apart. Luke 5, 32 says, I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. See, when you decide to live godly, you will be persecuted. You'll be set apart, mocked, laughed at. It's a choice you make. And if you make that choice to follow Christ, you need to put your hand to the plow and not turn back. 
But this is why so many call upon the name of the Lord, but they really never committed because they don't put their hand to the plow. Second Chronicles, though, this is the heart of God. It, it says, in my people who called by my name, humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Now, I want to remind you, the context of this passage is very, very important. This is to Israel. God has promised to give them a certain land. He promised if they would just be obedient, they'd come in the land, that they would, they would be there. Lengthy days, their families would be blessed. But they have this rebellious spirit. They've turned away. They worship the gods of this land. They become just like the Canaanites. And he's saying here, look, if, if you just humble yourselves and pray and seek my face and turn from your wicked ways, then I'll hear from heaven and will forgive your sin and heal your land. See, this is, this is the very nature and character of God. And, and this doesn't apply for us maybe healing our land, but, but God will receive us if we pray, if we call upon his name and humble ourselves. We pray and seek him and turn from our wicked ways. God will hear. God will bless you richly. And what the locust is, is eaten, he will return to you and me. Well, we see Israel's forgiveness in verses 7 through 11. And look with me. But as for me, I will watch expectantly for the Lord, and I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. I love this prayer. Don't you love it yourself, the fact that he cries out to God? So often people are saying, they're calling everybody and saying, would you pray for me, pray for me, pray for me? And they've never even gone to God themselves. The first place that you and I need to go is to God directly. God wants to hear from you. He loves to hear from you. He's waiting for you to call upon his name. Now, Micah here is a man of faith. Notice again that he says, I, I watch expectantly of the Lord. He, he's expecting God to move. And, and the Lord there is again Yahweh, the covenant God. And I will wait for God of my salvation. And my God will hear me. And I've often prayed with people, oh, Lord, please hear my prayer. Lord, please, please. God will hear any prayer of confession, first of all. The only thing that separates you from your God is your iniquity, your sin. And when you confess and you repent that sin, God will hear from heaven. And see, this is what we, we fail. Sometimes we're, we're begging God to do things when God is telling us how we need to come to him. Well, again, Micah demonstrates his trust, his personal belief and faith and intimacy in God the way he prays. I know when I pray as a, a group, it's always different than in my own personal prayer life. And I'm sure that's that way with you too. We pray as if he's right there. We thank him. We praise him. We don't have to beg God. So what does Micah do? He looks to the Lord. He waits for God of his salvation, knowing that God will hear his prayer. He's a man of faith. I love Hebrews 11.6. It says, without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. See, when we're praying, we're seeking him. We're looking to him. Unless we come with that heart, it's impossible to please him. See, the Bible assures us that God's salvation and promise of the kingdom is, is coming. Salvation's coming. We, we should be rejoicing and thanking God. I'm, I'm looking, and, and I know you're coming. Make me faithful. Make my hands faithful. Make my lips faithful. Put a watchman at my lips when I, when I speak too much. Help me to be the man, the woman that you'd have me be. Look with me in our text in verse 8. It says, Do not rejoice over me, O my enemy. Though I fall, I will rise. 
Though I dwell in darkness, the Lord is a light for me. And I will bear the indignation of the Lord because I have sinned against him. Until he pleads my case and executes justice for me, he will bring me out to the light. And I will see his righteousness. See, the enemy is laughing and gloating over him, literally rejoicing because, again, Israel is under judgment. Oh, that is discipline. God's dealing with them because of their iniquity and their sin. But at the same time, they, they know that as they confess, as they repent, God will restore them. They, they confess, they repent. They know it's only a matter of time, confident in their God. And this is what we need is have this confidence in God that God is faithful. Not faith in faith, but faith in a faithful God to do exactly what he said. Aren't you thankful that God's faithful, that God doesn't lie, that his word is truth? So they're gloating, and they think that they've won. They've won perhaps what seems to be the battle, but look out, because Jerusalem is going to rise again. How can a fallen city even make such a bold claim? Because this is what it's referring to, but, but God is the Lord who turns darkness into light. See, there's the difference. Israel once confessed her, her faith in the Lord, and now was the warning her enemies that she's going to rise again. Why? Because she, as I mentioned already, had confessed her sin, acknowledging that God's judgment was just. And now they were anticipating God's restoration. Micah looked to the future day when the Lord would reverse that judgment, just as he will one day reverse the curse upon this world. Psalm 30, verse 5 says this, For his anger is but for a moment, his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may last for the night, but a shout of joy comes in the morning. There's that assurance and confidence. And you see the psalmist does too. And, and, and this is what, as we grow in the love and grace of Jesus Christ, our faith is being built up. Even now, you're being washed in the word and, and faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. See, those who are repentant would be raised up. Let me add that word again, repentant. Those who are sincere, those are willing to turn away from their sin. Yes, they need help, but as they cry out, God gives them that help. Verse 10 in our text says, Then my enemy will see, and the shame will cover her who said to me, Where is your Lord, your God? My eyes will look on her, and at that time she will be trampled down like the mire in the streets. See, Israel will rise from her fall, be guided by the the light of the Lord. And for now, they're being disciplined. The Lord will open up their eyes. There's a remnant we're going to talk about in a little bit. God will open up their eyes. If you've truly been born again, you're a remnant in the church. Again, Israel in this context will be vindicated before the enemies perhaps standing there speechless in shock, maybe even grief, knowing that they're going to be under judgment. Notice again their word, the city, uh, they'll see the city enemy trampled as Jerusalem is, had been defeated. But right at the right time, their shame will cover their enemies. See, that ancient town, that city, the, the streets were dirty, their dirt and alleys and it was a place for dumping rubbish. And oftentimes down the center of the street, would, it would be kind of tailored like this. So there'd be a groove, water, rubbish would be in there. But it doesn't stop at that. See, they would dump, again, the household refuge, human. And they would be trampled in it. It became hard like mud, but they would be trampled in. Not very hygienic when you think about it, but a vivid metaphor the destination of Micah's mockers, those who are mocking the Lord, mocking Israel, his people. It's in verse 11 we see that restoration. It, it will be a day for building 
your walls, and on that day will be a, a boundary be extended. The common thought on this is that Jerusalem will have the walls built around it again. But I don't believe that's what it's saying. I believe that speaking again, as I already mentioned, that this is during the millennial kingdom. When Israel's restored, they've been given all this land, their boundaries have been extended, everything that God had promised to them. But what are the walls then? In Hebrew, that refers to the walls. A wall that be around a vineyard. Oh, it's low. You've seen them as we cross the island, the walls. Just dividing up different properties, more of a boundaries, not necessarily for protection. Listen as I read Numbers 22, verse 24. And then the angel Lord stood in the narrow path of the vineyards with a wall on the side and a wall on that side. This is what he's talking about, that same wall. It's just around the vineyard. And then Isaiah 5, 5 says, So now let me tell you what I'm going to do to my vineyard, referring to Israel. I will remove the hedge. It will be consumed. I will break down the wall. And it will become trampled on. This is what's happened to them at this point. God has allowed, again, the Syrians to come down, the Babylonians to come down, the battles to occur. But Zechariah, I love Zechariah chapter 2, verse 4 and 5. And he said to him, run and speak to the young man, saying, Jerusalem will be inhabited without walls because of the multitude of men and the cattle within. For I, declares the Lord, will be her wall of fire around her, and I will be the glory in her midst. The wall that is around Jerusalem is the Lord himself. The walls that is talking about is, again, the, the properties, everything that God intended for, again, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob to have. They will rebuild their nation, extend their boundaries. It's in Genesis 15, verse 18. Notice what it says. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram. And to your descendants, I have given this land from the river Egypt as far as the great river Euphrates. This is what it's talking about. It's going to be finally fulfilled at that point. God will fulfill every promise that he's given. Do you believe that? Don't just say it in your mind, but believe it and trust and rest in that and look forward anticipation and expectation. It's in verses 12 to 17. We see Israel's foes. It will be a day when they come to you from Assyria and the cities of Egypt, and from Egypt even to, even to the Euphrates, even from sea to sea and mountain to mountain. The earth will become desolate because of the inhabitants and on the count of the fruit of these deeds. See, what it's saying here, and this is important to understand, that, again, all the nations will come and there'll be honor given to Jerusalem. They will witness the, the desolation of the earth all due to the sin, but they will honor in the end the Lord. But it's going to be interesting as we go through. See, the people pray and they praise the Lord for his love, but, but something's going to happen, you're going to see. The book of Micah concludes, really, the conversation between the prophet and God. It's, this is what has been talking back and forth. The prophet prays that God, again, would be that good shepherd to his people. You've seen that in Psalm 23, and then in Jeremiah 13. And again, this speaks of his loving nature, and God answers prayer with promises for salvation. In verse 14, our text says, Shepherd your people with your scepter, the flock of your possession which dwells itself in the woodland forest, in the midst of a fruitful field. Let them feed in Bashan and Gilead in the days of old. It's interesting that the people in this, this, this forest is dark, and the forest is not a forest as you would think. There are high trees in that area that it's talking about, but it's a low shrub where people and animals and things can hide, and it's kind of a scary situation. And when he talks about Bashan and he talks about Gilead, it's a rich land, and Bashan is up high. It's on the eastern side, again, of the, the Sea of Galilee, overlooking the whole Sea of Galilee. And when you come down from Bashan, coming down to the south, you look at Gilead, and it's mountains and grapes and figs and olive trees. The land is rich. Again, it's important. And he's describing this scene here that 
He's talking about the richness. Lead your people there. Again, may the, the good shepherd take Israel, his flock, to the, these marvelous pastures that are in Bashan. And when I was there last time, and you can see it. It's just beautiful farmland, grassy land that was rich. And then as you would come down again on the eastern side of the Jordan and Gilead. See, to answer this prayer, God would have to restore the area under Israelite control. This is when it, the land, the millennium, would be fulfilled. It will be fulfilled then. Because really, this is part of Jordan. Part of it goes into Syria on the other side. The idea of a shepherd is used all throughout the ancient Middle East. The term shepherd applies to rulers. It applies to, to leaders. In fact, in Jeremiah, listen, Jeremiah 23, 2, it says this, Therefore, thus says the Lord God of Israel concerning the shepherds who are tending my people. You have scattered my flock, driven them away, have not attended them. Behold, I'm about to tend to you for your evil deeds, declares the Lord. And the Lord's going to deal with them. People are so angry at these shepherds. Those shepherds, people that are blind, people that don't want to believe the truth, follow these false shepherds. See, if you've been born again, you know a shepherd that loves the Lord and loves you because he speaks the truth and he speaks it in love. Now, John 10, 11 says this, I am the good shepherd referring to Jesus saying this, the good shepherd lays down his life and certainly he did that upon the cross. And John 10, 14 says, I am the good shepherd and I know my own and my own know me. I love watching sheep in, in Israel, the Middle East, because what's so wonderful about it, you see a flock 500, 200, 150, doesn't matter, and the shepherd walks ahead of them, and he just calls out here and there. They know the shepherd, and they follow him wherever he goes. He knows them all by name. It's so amazing to watch. You know, these shepherds oftentimes are young kids shepherding these flocks today. And that when they grow up, they will be a shepherd of the people if they learn these policies. David was a shepherd. Well, in verse 14, it says, become the seat. Again, the idea is they'll become a, a worldwide government. They'll be the headquarters for the whole world when Christ returns to rule. They'll be cared for by the Lord himself. He's that, that good shepherd. Uh, made the children, the flock, uh, the inheritance. You and I will be there as well, that he'll give them peace and prosperity. And like the fertile lands, as he mentioned in that text, Bijan and, and Gilead, as the days and old. Well, again, verse 15, it says, as the days when you came out of Egypt, I will show you miracles. And nations will see and be ashamed in all their might, and they will put their hand to their mouth and their ears will be deaf. Well, see here, the Lord's going to show his power and show his miracles of God. Miracles don't bring people to the Lord. Oh, there might be one, two. But people usually just want something for themselves and they go on and they quickly forget. And God will, again, shame and wipe out the powers with a deafening fear of the people. He's going to deal with them. It's interesting as we talk about this a little more, because God will cause the nations to humble themselves in the dirt. These are hard words, and it, it's contradictory in some cases to what some people teach. God will force the nations to face him, even tremble as we see in the text before him and his people. See, it's during the millennial kingdom, Jesus will rule with a rod of iron. That's the scepter meaning that there will still be people there when peace is there. They're still rebellious in nature. And God's going to have to deal with them. Verse 17, notice what it says. And they will lick the dust like a serpent, like the reptiles of the earth, and they will come trembling out of their fortress unto the Lord our God, and they will come in dread, and they will be afraid before you. Well, every knee will bow, but see, some of these are being forced to bow. This is hard concept for us to accept because we just have this idea. Everybody bows willingly. 
No, there's still hardness of heart. There's still rebellion. They still refuse to submit. There are those. Now, when it's talking about this serpent, you just think for a moment that, again, the serpent was crushed in the Garden of Eden, and it had to eat the dust. That was in Genesis 3.14. Likewise, the enemy nations will also be humbled. Psalm 72, verse 9 says this, Let the nomads of the desert bow before you, and his enemies lick the dust. See, this was a common phraseology of judgment, a humbling. The prayer, though, for you and me in the New Testament is, Come now, Lord Jesus. Amen. We know that he's coming. We were to, to pray for the peace in Jerusalem. Do you know what the peace in Jerusalem means? That there's going to be a battle. There's going to be a war. And when Jesus Christ finally rules and reigns, he's going to put his enemies under his feet. There'll be a lot of bloodshed. There'll be a tribulation. That'll be the only time there'll ever be peace in Jerusalem is when Jesus Christ rules and reigns. True believers struggling through these final days in the tribulation will long for his return. I think some of us are longing for his return now. I think you'll probably agree with me. Well, look with me in verses 18 and 20, our final verses tonight. It begins in verse 18. Who is a God like you who pardons the iniquity and passes over the rebellious acts of the remnant of his possession? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in unchanging love. And he will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities under his feet. Yes, he will cast all of our sin in the depths of the sea. And you will give truth to Jacob, unchanging love to Abraham, which you swore to our forefathers from the days of old. I like that phrase. Who is a God like unto you? See, this is talking about God's unchanging character. The remnant here is, is God is going to forgive. The question is, that I think everyone, this question, everyone should ponder, who is a God like you? Just to, to marvel, to lay back, think, sit, whatever you do, and, and just marvel at who God is. From the very beginning of the book of Genesis to through our history around us that we're aware of that God's hand has been upon your life, my life, this country and the world, and, and history is moving just as he's already told us it would. See, this hope is based upon God's unchanging character. Aren't you glad that he's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow? Unlike man, that one day they love you, they're fickle, the next day they hate you. You ever have that happen to you? I think all of us probably have. Well, again, the the hope is based upon God's unchanging character. And the key that they're talking about here is really this forgiveness of sin. And I want to read a few thoughts and verses for you. See, God removes our sins as far as the east is from the west in Psalm 103. God completely cleanses us from the stain of our sins. It's in Isaiah 118 where he talks about, come, let us reason. And your sins can be washed as white as snow. God throws our, sea, our sins, excuse me, behind his back in Isaiah 38. And in Jeremiah 31, it talks about God remembers our sins no more. Don't you like that one? And he treads on our iniquities under his foot. And in Micah 7, 19, yes, you will cast all of our sins into the depths of the sea. God chooses to deal with our sins when we confess and repent. He wants nothing to separate you from the love of God. He will not allow anything. See, because God's promise to Abraham, God would forgive sinners who didn't deserve any mercy. Every one of us here didn't deserve any mercy at all, did we? We deserved hell. But because of his nature, unchanging character, we can come to him, confess our sins, repent, and call upon his name, and he'll snatch us out of that miry clay. 
Matthew 23, 23 says this, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees and hypocrites, for you tie the mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier provisions of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. But these are the things that you should have done without neglecting others. What does God require from you? Justice, mercy, and faithfulness. See, Luke 6, 36 says this, Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. We should be merciful, the most merciful people on earth. The scripture is very clear in 1 Corinthians. The context would be a little different, but why not be wrong? Why is it so important we have to win an argument? They'll lose the battle in the end. Galatians 6, 7, I'm sure you know it well too, but do not be deceived. God will not be mocked for whatever a man sows. This will also he weep, reap. I want to reiterate one thing. In spite of Israel's unfaithfulness to God, God intended to fulfill every unconditional promise. Given what was called the Abraham covenant with Abraham, Confirmed to Isaac and Jacob, as already mentioned. See, it was talked about in Malachi 4, 6, and he will restore the hearts of the fathers to the children, the hearts of the children to the fathers, so that I will, I will not come and smite the land with a curse. See, God it will fulfill every promise. And, and elsewhere in the scripture, it says all of Israel will be saved, and people get excited, every Jew will be saved. This is not what is teaching I want to show you, again, Romans 9, 27 on the screen. Notice what it says. Isaiah cries out concerning Israel. Though the number of the sons of Israel will be like the sand of the sea, it is a remnant that will be saved. Who is the remnant? The ones who believe in God. Take him at his word. Knows him personally. Seeks first the kingdom of God, his righteousness. This is not based upon our good works. It's faith in a faithful God that we just, because we realize what he's done, we give our lives to him. Not trying to find favor. We realize that we're given favor when he snatched us out of that miry clay. I remember a testimony of a, an Indian one time. and The Indian was asked, again, what was your salvation experience? What did it mean? The Indian, because he talks in pictures much like the Middle Eastern people, piled a bunch of dry leaves up in a pile and took this little worm and laid it on the dry leaves and he lit the leaves on fire. Flames are going up and he reaches in that fire, grabbed that little worm and he held it close to his heart. He says, that's what God did to me. He lifted me out of the fire. And he held me to his heart. See, the remnant knows what God has done, knows that love of God. And nothing, nothing will separate you from the love of God. The prophecy of God's in time mercy to Israel should fill our hearts with joy when we stop and think, of, what a marvelous God he is. There's an old hymn, it's the great God of wonders by Samuel Davis. Let me read a part of it. It says, the great God of wonders in all thy ways are matchless, godlike, and divine, but the bright glories of thy, gra thy grace above thine other wonders shine who are parting God like thee or who has the grace so rich and free. How do we describe our God, what God has done for us, like the Indian or this man that writes this poem. I like what George Adam Smith said. Other nations have been our teachers in art and wisdom and government, but Israel is our mistress in pain and patience. In her suffering, Israel will at last say, I will look unto the Lord, and she will be like the prodigal son in the far country who said when he came to his senses, I will rise and go to my father. And the remnant, the true Israel will return to God. It's during the, the millennial kingdom when Israel will return. Return to God. 
their father. Father, thank you tonight for this book. And Lord, it has revealed you, your love, your unchanging love, your mercy, your grace, your faithfulness of everything that you are, what you will do. We look to you. We anticipate that you're coming soon. And Lord, we long to see this world just as you intended it to be right from the very, very beginning. A world where there's no sin and pain. The work is finished at each of us. Those who have been martyrs will be brought there standing before you, rejoicing, thanking you for what you allowed in their lives because Lord, they're not the same because of what you have allowed them to go through. Lord, give us the boldness in these end times, in these dark times, to, to shine the light brighter than ever, to speak your word, your truth and love. Lead us and guide us to those that you're drawing to you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. steadfast love of the Lord never ceases His mercies never come to an end They are new every morning New every morning Great is Thy faithfulness O Lord Great is thy faithfulness the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases his mercies never come to an end they are new every morning new every morning Great is thy faithfulness, O Lord. Great is thy faithfulness, O Lord. Great is thy faithfulness. We have so much to be thankful for. He truly is faithful. His mercies are new every morning. Father, you have been so, so good to us. So unworthy. Yet you have reached down into the mire. You have lifted us up. You have put us on the rock. You have sustained us and you will keep us. And the amazing thing is that we will be the inheritance of you, Jesus. Yeah. So we thank you for tonight. We bless your name. We thank you for your precious word. We pray for those again that are watching and the persecuted countries and things that are going on around the world as it gets darker and darker. Strengthen our brothers. Strengthen our sisters, we pray. Bring them to remembrance often. So Lord, thank you for being there. Thank you that you will be there for them as well. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. We'll see you guys Sunday morning, 9 o'clock. We're continuing in Peter. God bless you. Have a wonderful night in the Lord.